Good morning. It's good to see so many people here this morning and good to know folks are online as well and participating with us. Um, and so we just ask that you would go ahead and stand and we'd like to sing this morning about our love for the Lord.
Good morning. And uh, good to see everybody here today, and what a beautiful day again. And uh, welcome again to those here, here and anyone on uh, line uh, watching us on the Facebook live streaming. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, those on uh, line, please uh, let us know you're watching. Uh, do the heart signal and uh, maybe the comment or two. Uh, whatever you want to leave there with us, but uh, everybody here uh, in the building, please uh, fill out the attendance card, and uh, you can put leave that on your uh, chair or put it in the offering plate there as you leave. And uh, I just want to say uh, a real quick thing about our offering. We've been putting the buckets out, and and such a great response. You just have really uh, been very diligent and uh, thoughtful about keeping up with all of that. So uh, thank you. For, for your faithfulness in that, in that particular area. Um, and uh, I'll have a few other announcements at the uh, end of the hour, but uh, good morning to, uh, to you. And uh, these songs are perfectly laid up for the message that's coming. Um, Matt and Andy are in a, a new series called The Shift, The Shift, and he'll tell you about that, but uh, the songs are uh, well, well planned out, Judy. Thank you. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for our uh, time together this morning, this beautiful Lord's Day, and thank you for each one here. Thank you for those online, and uh, Lord, uh, I, I pray that you would just uh, continue to uh, um, speak to us this morning, and I pray that uh, we will hear you. We will respond to you accordingly, and uh, I pray that you will uh, hear uh, our hearts, hear these praises, that they would honor and glorify you. And you'd be uh, well pleased with what you hear and see today. Thank you for each one here. I pray your blessing upon us as we continue. And uh, Lord, may we uh, just open our lives to you and uh, lay our lives down before you this morning. And I pray these things in Jesus' name.
powerful name, right? Amen. Amen. You know, when we truly recognize what a beautiful, wonderful, powerful God that we have and, and his son, Jesus, our Savior, our response is just to worship him. And you've been doing that this morning. And we've sung about laying our lives down before him and, and giving up our life. Matt's going to be preaching about loving God and how to do that and why we do that. Um, and we're going to share uh, just a real important passage here in just a moment. But when we respond with our worship, and by the way, worship is not just singing when we come together. It is 24-7. It's all of our lives in worship, laying down our lives. We offer up a living sacrifice, not some dead animal on an altar. It is a, we are a living sacrifice, living, breathing sacrifice for our God. And that truly, truly shows our love for our Father, for God. And um, that is our sacrifice. That is our gift to him, is our lives and our hearts. And that's what he asks. One of my favorite passages in scripture is found in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And you've probably realized that's where we're going to go. And we're gonna, I'm going to have Phil read from the New International Version. And then Abby read uh, the same verses from the message, which is just a paraphrase. But uh, just kind of adds, adds some different words in, in kind of in modern language and helps us understand this passage maybe just a little bit better. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you.
few uh, times in the Bible where God used people and used them in a negative way. Uh, I think of Pharaoh when he hardened his heart and wouldn't let him change his attitude toward the Israelites. Um, Another one is Judas. But when you look at these people's lives, God knew their heart. He knew that Pharaoh was a very evil person. And so he used that. Uh, It wasn't that he took innocent people and made them evil. He used the evil that was in a person because they had surrendered to that evil. Uh, One of those people is who I'm going to talk about this morning. I'm going to start by reading uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? And has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I got a little uh, article offline, and I had to cut it down a little bit, but I wanted to read it to you. It's a view of one man had when he was looking at uh, the Last Supper, the original Last Supper um, that Jesus instituted. If he's, and he says, if you look in Matthew, Luke, and John, you'll find their narratives of how the Last Supper went down. And each one refers to Jesus dipping the bread with Judas. In John's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 26, the King James Version refers this time as when Jesus dipped the sop. It reads like this. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Uh, Toward the end here of this feast, uh, there's a symbolic time. The participants would make a sandwich of matzah and what they called bitter herb, or which we would refer to as horseradish. Then they would dip it in... uh, I always get this wrong, Harl set, and I practice this over and over, and I still can't get it right. Um, but it's a mixture of uh, fruits, um, uh, nuts, and honey. It's a sweet dip. And so they would take this little sandwich they made of, of horseradish, dip it into that sweet mixture. Uh, so this may sound tasty to you, but horseradish is extremely potent when you eat it, Your eyes begin to water almost immediately, and the more you eat, the hotter it gets. During the supper, Jesus dipped the sop, then gave it to Judas, 
This is the man who would betray, betray him with a kiss and send him to his execution. Of course, this was all done through God's guidance, but the betrayal was no less painful to Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, later that night, Jesus prayed for God to let this cup pass from him. What I've learned is that the sop, after it was dipped, was supposed to be given to someone you love for them to eat. Jesus dipped the sop and gave it to Judas. He loves us even when we betray him. Now, the difference between us and Judas is that we, I think every one of us here, I believe, has turned from that life. Matt's going to preach a powerful sermon on how to turn from that life and how to turn it into a, a work for Jesus Christ. I, I often wondered, what, what would Judas have written? What kind of a letter would he have written to churches if he had turned his life around? But he didn't, not like the other apostles. But... Um, Jesus has given each of us the opportunity to turn back. And even someone like Judas, who, who he, he stole from Jesus right from the beginning of their ministry. He had the, the uh, treasury, and he would steal from it. He saw God on earth working, and he still turned away from him. But even though he did that, right to the bitter end, Jesus Christ loved Judas for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to, to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And we had given thanks. He broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Even though we deny him, even though we fail, even though we stumble, God still loves us. And in that sinful time, the sinful condition, he sent Jesus Christ to suffer, to die, to be tortured because of our sin. Just try to remember this all week long so that when you are tempted, that you will think, I don't want to trample underfoot the body of Jesus Christ. Dear Father God, I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for the kingdom that he has established your church here on earth. I thank you that we have a chance to be saved from the evil that we often do. Please, Lord, help us at this time to remember your son, remember what he did, and throughout this week to keep that remembrance and to look for every opportunity to serve you and every opportunity to turn down Satan's temptations. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, so this morning, as uh, Chuck mentioned, we are starting a new series called The Shift. And uh, if you look at the graphics uh, that we have for uh, this particular sermon series, you might feel like you are looking at something out of a elementary science book. Uh, it depicts a prism with white light passing through the prism and then exiting on the other side, separated into the colors of the rainbow. That prism has changed that white light. And that's why we chose to use this image as a graphic for this sermon series, because it is an apt illustration for transformation, for change, for something that has been shifted. It starts one way, goes through a process, and exits another. Have you ever had a, a moment or a season in your life that was like that? That was like a, a prism where you entered one way, went through it, and by the time you were on the other side, you were completely changed? You know, the church, we went through something like that here recently. Uh, you know, several weeks ago as the COVID pandemic began and we were, you know, forced to make the decision to close on-site worship, we had to scramble to come up with a workable online streaming solution. I can't tell you how unprepared for that I was. I knew very little about sound, very little about video, very little about audio capture, or anything that went into what needed to happen to take what we do in this room and put it online in a way that was actually enjoyable to experience and watch. I can tell you, those first few weeks, Andy and I felt like two monkeys trying to build a race car out of lawnmower parts with no directions. <laughs> And we went through a change. We went through a change fueled by YouTube and fueled by a desire to make it as good as we could. And over the course of those next 12 weeks as we went through it and got a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better, we were able to purchase, we were able to build a pretty good race car. And we even know how to drive it most Sundays. <laughs> but... In all seriousness, that was a change that we went through. And I want to take just, just a moment and, and kind of step away from that for a second because we just don't do this enough and this is a good opportunity to do this. I want you to, to think about the people in the balcony just behind you manning the soundboard and manning the computer and manning the live stream. If you're home right now and you're watching that, just say thank you to them, just a little prayer. We appreciate them because they've gone through a shift as well. A difficult challenge and honor ours, yes. We need those people and so we are so thankful for them and the time they've put in going through that. But back, in all seriousness, back to what we're talking about. Shifting, changing. We go through moments like that in our life. We go through experiences that grow us, change us, transform us, shift us. Uh, and sometimes they're small, like this temporary solution, this problem that we had to get through that, that changed us and grew us and moved us forward as a church. But other times they're much more significant and they have much more lasting and meaningful impact on the people that we are. Things like becoming an adult. Things like going to college, getting married, having children, moving jobs, losing loved ones, retiring. All of these things are dramatic moments and things that shift us, change us, grow us, move us to be different than what we were when we started them. And so this series, we're going to be looking at one moment that stands out above the rest. One moment that changes us grows us, moves us more so than any other moment that we experience. You could call it the shift. And this moment is the moment when we are confronted with and accept the gospel, 
the moment we meet God for the first time and we choose to follow him, we undergo a transformation process that completely changes who we are. In one moment, we, we enter just like that white light through a prism and on the other side, we come out completely different than the way we entered. And so, as we, we move into this series, we're going to look at two relationships that, that are dramatically affected by this shift, this moment in time. And we can find those two relationships in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. Jesus is, is teaching and the religious leaders of the day are, are coming to him and they're, they're challenging him with what they believe is going to be difficult questions. And so throughout this whole chapter, there, there's pepper in Jesus with questions, questions, questions. And you get to this moment and the Pharisees decide they're going to they're ask him this question and they're going to see how he responds. This is what they say. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So in this short but powerful little response, Jesus shows us that there are two relationships that dramatically change when we accept the gospel. And the first is how we love God. He says that's the greatest commandment. There's, there's one thing that you should do above all else, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And so today we're going to be taking some time to understand the nature of that relationship, the nature of our relationship with God, how we love him, why we love him, what does that look like, and how does that choice to love God change us and grow us and move us and shift us to be something different than what we were when we started. And so Jesus says that all the law and the prophets are wrapped up into this one command, simple command, love God. So tomorrow we're going to unpack that question by asking two questions. The first is this, why do we love God? And the second is, how do we love God? And as we move through those two questions, I think we're going to see, we're going to see the nature of this relationship. We're going to see how God transforms us, how God changes us, how this moment is the moment that shifts us above all else. So on to that first question. Why do we love God? I mean, after all, it's worth asking, right? If Jesus is going to say, this is the greatest commandment, love God, it's worth exploring why. Why should we love God? Why is God a God worthy of our love? There are lots of reasons why God is worthy of our love, but two stand out above the rest. The first is this, we love God because God loved us first. 1 John 4.10 says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. As that verse puts into stark reality our relationship with God as humans. In our sinful nature, we do not love God. Our very core is a heart of rebellion against God. Our nature is to rebel, to do what we want to do. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did in the very beginning, right? They did what they wanted to do. They wanted to be like God. And that's exactly what we want to be. Every human on this face of this earth... We have that in our heart, that we want to be like God. We want to do what we want to do. That is how God finds us. John says that it is in that state that God loves us. That as rebels, as those that would 
seek to usurp God's authority, God still loves us. So much that he was willing to crawl up on a cross and die for us. Solely to save us from ourselves. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, Jesus didn't die for us because we were righteous or that we were somehow worth it or worthy of it. We weren't. We weren't. We aren't. But yet, he still chooses to do it because he loves us first. He loves us when we are unlovable. He loves us when we would spit in his face. He still loves us. He knows the dark depths of our heart. He knows the things we hope nobody ever knows about us. He knows every evil thing we've ever thought or done. And he doesn't look at us with wrath. He looks at us and says, I love you. I love you enough to crawl on a cross and die for you. And you didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to be good enough. You didn't have to be perfect enough. We aren't. We never could be. He loved us first. So we love God because he loved us first. He loved us in the midst of our mess and our brokenness. That's one reason. The second reason we love God is because he transforms who we are. See, God finds us as these broken and twisted people whose only desire is to do what we want to do and says, I love you and I'm going to promise to change you. One of my favorite passages in the whole Bible is from Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 28, and this is what it says. It says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. That verse is a powerful word picture of what God promises to do in us when we begin a relationship with him. He says, I will take your heart of stone. I will take that twisted, sinful nature and I'm going to move it. I'm going to replace it. I'm going to transform it. I'm going to shift it into a heart of flesh that wants to keep my commands that wants to follow me, and then you will be my people, and I will be your God. God promises to change us from the inside out. I love how Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 24, contrasts the differences the Spirit makes in our life. It starts by saying this, it says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. This is what we are before we meet God. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That's what we are. That's what humans do. That's us wanting to be our own gods, setting our own will, and doing what we want to do. Those are the acts of the flesh. But, it says, this is what the Spirit does. But the fruit of the Spirit 
is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. The fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit. God promises to give us His Spirit and transform us from these people who are motivated by the acts of the flesh to those who embody the fruit of the Spirit. It's a new heart, a new spirit. The Holy Spirit produces fruit in us that transforms us at the heart level. The second reason we love God is because He promises to transform us, to change us, to make us into the creations He always wanted us to be. So we love God because He loved us first, even when we were broken and wicked. And we love God because He wants to change us from those broken, wicked people into something beautiful and new. So that's why. That's why we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. But the next question is how? How do we do that? How do we love God with the kind of devotion that Jesus was talking about? How do we have that kind of transformative relationship with God? There are three ways that we can love God. Three ways that we show God that kind of devotion. And when we practice all three of these ways, we will experience the shift, the transformation that God is talking about. And the first is this. We love God by giving Jesus our allegiance. And what do I mean by that? Well, before we can do anything else, we must decide how we're going to respond to what God has offered us. God has said, I will love you no matter what you are like. I will love you first. Before you even move an inch towards me, I will love you. And I will promise you that if you come to me, I will transform you. That is the free gift that God has put out there for every human on this planet. But we have to decide what we're going to do with it. We have to decide what we're going to do with that gift. And we have two choices. We can hear that offer. We can hear that. And we can choose to walk away from it. We can choose to leave that gift on the table. Or we can choose to accept it by submitting and acknowledging and giving our allegiance to God as our Lord. By putting him back in the proper place that he is always supposed to have been in in our hearts. If you look up the word allegiance in the dictionary... It is defined as loyalty or commitment of a subordinate, us, to an authority, God. If we choose to accept this gift that God has offered us, then we have to give him our allegiance. We have to be willing to say, I am not God, you are God, I will follow you, I will bend my knee to you, Jesus. You are my Lord. We have to lay ourselves down, lay down that sinful desire to do what we want to do and choose to allow God to be our authority, to be our Lord. Acts 2, 36-39 offers a great example of exactly how to do this. It's, it's on the day of Pentecost and this is what it says. It says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. So these are the very people who put Jesus on the cross and they've seen the Holy Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost and Peter preaches this powerful sermon and they're convicted of the truth that God has offered this gracious gift to them. And they say they're cut to the heart. They're they're remorseful for what they've done. They want to change. They want to experience the shift. And they say, what should we do? And Peter says, simply submit. Repent and be baptized. Make Jesus your authority. Give him your allegiance. Lay yourself down. It's a simple action step. Repent. Turn from the sinful way. Turn from who you were. Turn from those acts of the flesh. And bend the knee to Jesus in the waters of baptism. Make him your Lord. Make him your authority. That is the first step to accepting the gift that God has offered. That is the first step to loving God with the kind of devotion that Jesus is talking about. So before we can love God, we have to accept him. We have to decide that we want a relationship with God. The second thing we can do to show God we love him is commit to following his commands. 1 John 5 1 through 3 says this, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God. To keep his commands. That verse makes it clear that Part of loving God is keeping his commands. It is doing the things that God would have us to do. Living the way that we were always intended to live as the kind of people God always created us to be. And this is not done out of a place of fear, but out of a place of authentic desire. That we want to follow God's commands. We want to be the kind of people he's created us to be. When we're transformed by the Holy Spirit, we move to a place where we desire to keep the commands of God. And it's through this working out of a transformed heart that we display our love for God. Because we've been so changed by Him, because He's so radically shifted who we are as people, we now desire to keep His commands. We now want to do the works of the Spirit, not the works of the flesh. Now, this doesn't mean that we will never be disobedient or that we will never fall short because, of course, we will because until the other side of heaven, we are still a work in progress. But our attitude, our disposition towards those failures is transformed from one of apathy to one of deep regret where we want to be different, where we mourn our acts of the flesh. And desire more acts of the Spirit. This is love for God to keep His commands. So we love God by giving Him our allegiance. We love God by committing ourselves to following His commands. The last way we show our love for God is this. We love God by building a relationship with Him. This, I believe, is the most concrete way to show God we love him. Building a real relationship with God is exactly what it sounds like. It's moving God from this place of occupying this otherworldly idea or this theoretical existence to a place where God is a real person. 
where God is a real thing that we can have an authentic relationship with. It is understanding that God desires to know us. And he desires to know us because we love him enough to give him permission to access our hearts of our own free will and choice. See, see God is God, and he has the power to know our hearts without our choice. But one of the most amazing things about God is that he wants us to choose him. That is a real relationship. Real relationships require permission. Building a relationship with God is desiring to pray, not to fulfill a checkbox or a spiritual to-do list, but because you want to express your heart and thoughts to the God who created and saved you. Building a relationship with God is reading the Bible not because you want to know more knowledge, but because you genuinely want to hear the word of life engage the Holy Spirit inside you. God wants a relationship with you that isn't born out of guilt or obligation, but is born out of relentless desire to know him more fully. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. In James 4, 8. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Both of those verses speak to the truth that God is there. He is waiting for you on the other side of a relationship that he wants to know you for you. He loves us more fully than we could ever know and he wants us to choose him. He wants us to choose a relationship with him. That is how we show him we love him. We show him we love him by giving him our allegiance, by committing to following his commands, but most of all, by pursuing him the same way we would pursue a friend we love or a family member we care about. Because God is real and the relationship is real. It isn't a spiritual checkbox. It isn't a, another thing to do. God is a person to know. And he wants to know you and me. And he wants us to know him. And so as we close this morning, I hope we're ready to experience that shift, that change, where we enter this moment of meeting God one way, but on the other side, we're going to come out far different, far more beautiful than the one we entered. That is the defining moment when we allow the gospel of Jesus to change us forever. The moment we realize that God loves us even at our worst, even when we are totally unlovable, God loves us. That God promises to transform us and that gift is out there if we pursue a relationship with him. And now, now many of you here, you already know that because you've been, you've been trying to love God like this for a long time. And so maybe this is just a gentle reminder to seek God more fully. To commit ourselves to an ever-deepening relationship with God. He loves us. He wants to know us. Let's seek him. But maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you haven't gone through the shift yet. Maybe you're just checking out church. Maybe you're checking us out online. Maybe this is all new to you. You're not sure where you sit. I want you to know that God has made that offer. He loves you exactly where you are right now, more than you could ever know. 
He wants to transform you. He wants to change you into something better. This morning is an opportunity to accept that gift. And so we're going to sing another song here in just a moment. If you're here this morning and, and this is new and you're feeling maybe a little twinge in your heart and you're not sure what to do with that, I want to encourage you not to wait to commit yourself over the course of this next song to do something with the knowledge, to do something with this truth so you can experience the shift that is waiting. As we sing this song, make a commitment that you're going you're gonna to have another conversation, that you're not going to leave here today until you have fully explored what a relationship with God might look like. Or maybe... We're here this morning. We just need to commit ourselves that, that no more is our prayer life or our Bible reading going to be out of obligation or out of commitment. That we're going to do this because we love God and because we want to know Him. Because He's worth knowing. Whatever it is that we need to do this morning, take this time and commit yourself to it. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for the truth that you love us, God, no matter who we are or what we've done. God, I thank you that you have given us access to your Holy Spirit to change us, to transform us, to grow us into the people that, that you always wanted us to be. Lord, I pray now that as we come to this moment, this set-apart moment, God, that it would be the moment where we shift when we become transformed, when we become changed into the people that you want us to be. God, I pray now that, that we wouldn't be afraid. We wouldn't be afraid to come to you. God, we wouldn't be afraid to submit ourselves to you in repentance and in baptism. Lord, I, wouldn't, I would pray that we wouldn't be afraid to, to seek you more fully, to, to fully allow you to see our heart to give you full access to all that we are through prayer and, and through your word. Lord, I pray now that as a church and as people, we would just be so passionately in love with you, God, that with all we are, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, everything we have, God, that we would seek you with it. And Lord, you promise. You promise us that when we seek you, we will find you. So, Lord, we thank you for that. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing the song as our commitment this morning. Take my life and
Thanks, Matt. I appreciate that, and I think you all do too. Uh, amen? amen. And a great message and a great uh, series coming up here, uh, The Shift, and uh, God transforming us, God changing us, God. Uh, and, and, and those two questions, you know, why do we, why do we love God? And how can we uh, show God that we love him? Great, great, uh, simple little outline for us that uh, we can all put into practice uh, from uh, uh, throughout this week. Well, I got a couple, three things that I need to uh, mention to you. Um, some things that you need to be reminded of. Um, the uh, DCC Kids Live uh, program or uh, uh, segment on Facebook uh, is every Wednesday uh, at 6.30. Uh, this is for our elementary uh, kids, uh, first through fifth grade, basically. And uh, what, we, what you need to know is if uh, you are a parent of one of those children, uh, we have kits made up for uh, family activities for each of the weeks of July, uh, each of those sessions. And so uh, we have them today. If you're here and need to grab one, uh, we'll, we'll get that to you. Or we can deliver it to you uh, if you can't uh, uh, come and get it. Uh, you're hearing this on uh, Facebook right now. Uh, so that's first thing, uh, every Wednesday, uh, 6.30, uh, DCC Kids Live. Okay, and secondly, our senior high, um, we're not able to go to Holland, uh, to Hope College, and the uh, CIY move event that uh, is held there every year. It was canceled because of the virus, but, but Andy has put together uh, a retreat at Rock Lake, uh, August 13th through the 16th, and um, uh, here's what you need to know. You need to know, uh, as a high schooler, they know already probably, but parents, uh, August 1st, need to be registered by August 1st. And uh, uh, getting the details there for that. So uh, interesting, CIY uh, has, has had to cancel their events throughout the country. And yet they were able to make their material, you know, uh, maybe messages by um, uh, on disc or whatever, uh, CDs and, and DVDs. And, and so Andy will be using that material at that retreat. And some of the same things that they would have had at, uh, at uh, Holland and the Hope College, uh, they'll be doing at the retreat at Rock Lake. So anyway, uh, last thing is uh, 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 the last Sunday of July, we're going to have a campfire, church-wide campfire uh, gathering at Mark and Brenda uh, Maseric Pond, uh, just east of the high school here on Colony Road. And uh, that'll be at 6 p.m. We'll give you some more details. We're not sure how we're going to do the food on that day, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna eat. I'm sure we're going to eat. And uh, we're going to have a great time down there. And so... Uh, maybe it'll cool off a little bit by then. But, uh, hey, uh, again, great day to be together. Uh, beautiful Lord's Day. And uh, good to see everybody uh, I mean, online. Hope that you were able to take in that everything uh, went well online as well. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to stand. I'll close with our closing prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great love for us. You loved us first even in our condition, and you love us even now, no matter what we're going through. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for this reminder about how, um, why, we, why we are to love you and how we can love you. Uh, just, just some pointed things. And, and Lord, I thank you for that precious promise that if we seek you with all our heart, we will find you. And I, I thank you for those who are gathered here today. I pray that each of us are building our relationship with you and, and um, we're, we're drawing closer to you in our walk. And so I, I just pray your blessing on each one as we depart from this place. Uh, Lord, help us not to be uh, comfortable in our uh, uh, walk with you, but to, to, to stretch that, to, to grow, to lay ourselves down, to, to give you our full allegiance. I pray as we leave this place, Lord, that your spirit would guide us and direct us in all that we say and do during this uh, day and this week. And I, I just pray that you bless the week ahead, Lord. Um, help us to see that you're in the transforming business and you are changing us um, on a daily basis. 
I, I pray that you just bless us as we uh, go now. We thank you for our time together today and um, just ask your blessing on each one. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.